Hi, hello again. Welcome to Legislative Update. And with me again is Representative Erica Leon from Derry. And uh, we little change of plans here. We're going to do some some bills that had passed and and governor signed. But the problem is getting bills over to the governor has taken a while. Uh, um, we'll go through that. But first thing I want to do is cover a little bit again of what we covered last week on uh, CRT. So I'm going to pull that up. Uh, oh, thank you. This is the law as it stands now. It's been signed and put in in law, 193.40, prohibition on teaching discrimination. No pupil in any public school in this state shall be taught, instructed, inculcated, which is another word for indoctrination, or compelled to express belief in or support for any one of the following. And, you know, that any race is inherently superior to people, or any race is inherently racial. Racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. So in other words, the CRT is gone. You can't teach it. It's racist by itself. If you look up the definition of racism, you'll see that if you say any race is better or worse, that's racism. And you can still teach history, but teach all of history. And a good example of I always bring up is the Crusades. And everybody thinks that's a racist thing with the Crusades. The Europeans went into the Mideast. Yeah, after Muslims invaded Europe. Come on, people. Do all of history. And, and one of the good ways to look at it, too, is you, if you just switch who you're talking about. And you mm -hmm. have A and B. If you say A is, race, a is oppressing B, just or A is inferior to B, check and see if you'd be okay with it if it said that B was inferior to A. Yeah. Because if you wouldn't say something about any other group, it becomes a lot more challenging there. Yeah, and I remember you brought it up last week, is the, the three-fifths thing. That, w that was a, a racial thing. That was a political thing done, done by the northern states to keep the number of congressmen in the south lower than it should be. So the census taking, so I'm wondering it'd be nice if somebody in history would go back and look at the 1820, 1840 census and see what the difference would have been. So maybe history would have been a whole lot different. So think of it, think, like I said, teach the whole history. And violation of this section by any educator shall be considered a violation of the educator code of conduct that justifies disciplinary act sanction by the State Board of Education. That could mean losing your credentials, okay? And educator means pretty much anybody working in the school system. And put it this way, your school board approved the curricula curriculum, not the NEA, not the AFT, the school board. So if this is being, caught now, being taught now illegally, your school board is to blame and teachers can lose their accreditation. So with that, I just want to highlight that again and move on to uh, what we, our agenda was going to be. So the first thing, somebody brought up the issue after last week's thing is, how do I find the bill? And I thought I had covered it the first week, but that was months ago. Anyway, so you can go to government, state legislature, and we go down here, find the 2021 bill. And you see down here the advanced bill status search. Now, and title search. And sometimes you have to play with words. And somebody asked a question about what happened with the tinting window bit. So I'll put in tint. Tint. And go down here to sub submit it, to search for it. And there it is, HB 224. That was faster than home. <laughs> relative to tinted windows on motor vehicles, relative to civil liability to damage the highways, and relative to employee access to motor vehicle records. The problem with that is initially the tinting in the Senate added some stuff to it. But anyway, basically, if you look at the bill, 
real simple. It just it pretty much changes it. You just can't tint your windshield. <laughs> you know, but looks like you can tint the windows on the left hand side of the driver. Okay, but the yeah, as you know, so there might be a dock or whatever. But that's part of it. So anyway, you can read that yourself. And so that bill, it actually makes it so that things that are legal in states next to us are also legal here. Because sure. you'd have people crossing the border and suddenly having an illegally tinted window. And mm -hmm. when we have these little issues that can have somebody stop for something that's not important, it, you know, in this really heightened climate, it puts everybody right. at risk. So I'm yeah. glad that they fixed this so we're not going to get people pulled over when they don't need to yeah. get pulled over. And then another point, too, another something we can also look at is go back. Is you know all our sessions <coughs> are <coughs> videoed. They're recorded. So, and sometimes that's not really where it should be. Is the thing. And if I go on the government again, and state legislature. Hello, come on, come on, come on, come on. Well, you changed it when you said it was faster than home. <laughs> it was a while ago. So it's a, there's a button here that says streaming video when it comes up. Come on, welcome to the New Hampshire General Court. We know. Streaming media, right there. And then house session. Okay? And so we'll go to the April session we had. And it was a three day section. You can see it was the 7th, 8th, and 9th. And we'll go to on the 9th. And there was an AM session and a PM session. So I'll pull up the PM session. <clears throat> now the thing is, which is interesting, you'll see how bad this is where we were holding our sessions at the uh, Boston Sportsplex rather than where we should be, which hopefully this will be the last time this year that we'll be there. But, and if I go to one forty-seven, because I already hunted this up, and and I'll go back a little bit here, and we'll come on, full screen, and there you can see Erica talking on the bill HB 251 and there's me in the foreground which I didn't realize I was there but you can see this is kind of sloppy at the sportsplex people are all over they're you know not you know not sitting where they should be and but you know there's no ante room you can go into so it's very you know non-professional but anyway so with that so that's how you can do things and theoretically you can select times and share it you hit the share thing here but i tried it and it, it takes this video and you can send it to your facebook or whatnot but it said i got a hb i got a, a 404 error saying that wasn't there so I, I think last time i tried to do this i had to save the whole video and then use a, a regular another video editor to manipulate it. So if, you, if you look at the Senate streaming media, they actually have it set up so they have the agenda. So you can click on it and it'll send you to the bill and what's happening. So that's yeah. been really nice that's when we've been trying to follow up with what's happening in their yeah. session. Yeah. But for us, we just look at the screen here on the House sessions. Yeah, that's what I was doing was um, moving the cursor. Try, okay, they see. Because I'm looking at the calendar to see where it was and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look how messy that is. Yeah. If you bring that up again. I mean, that's very unprofessional. I mean, yeah. Uh, and it was so hard to hear what was going on, too, yeah. Yeah, because there were times when I'd put on my headphones just to be able to listen to it over the streaming media because yeah. it echoed so much in that yeah. chamber. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to getting to the house. So it'll yeah. be my first time actually in session on the floor when we get back. So, so what we'll do is, since that was a bill that was near and dear to Erica's heart, it, what, it was really a, I call it a ridiculous bill, but it actually passed the House 
even though it's we not. tried to keep killing it. So but anyway, it's uh, actually really interesting if you want to pull up the docket on that one. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. So when we pull up the bills, yeah, you can also see all of the crazy, crazy things that happened. That yeah. bill, um, House Bill 251, was for child car, child passenger restraints. Right. It started off just um, saying that children under two years of age that were um, under 40 inches of height and under 40 pounds would be required to be rear facing in the car. Uh, so the problem with that is that, you know, I, I can get into those. There's problems because when you're trying to fit kids into a car, you can't fit these car seats into a lot of different vehicles. Right. We have a giant Sequoia and then we have a little Mercedes sedan. And I had to try out the different infant seats to even find one that fits for my uh, now now twenty month year old right. with his two brothers in the and back he's seat. A pretty big, but he's boy, he's but a good size kid. Yeah. Um, and and even in the Sequoia, it's hard to fit. That's I call it my giant Sequoia, and it's hard to fit too many of those rear facing ones in with other kids in their booster seats. Right. So it started off as something where most parents try and keep their kids rear facing, but there's good valid reasons to turn them around before they're two. Um, it was amended on the floor to get rid of that 40 pound, it was amended to get rid of the 40 pound restriction. So even if you had a kid who was gonna be the future linebacker, that kid would still have to be rear facing even if they were 45 pounds before they were two years yeah. old. They're yeah. outliers, but those kids are out there. Yeah. So that's when, that's when we moved and we were talking about tabling the bill which would put it away right, for a that while would land and the table and then it, yeah indefinitely postpone all the different ways that you can try to stop it and it passed um and so then it moved from the house in that april night session over to the senate so uh my senator regina birdsell is actually the chair of transportation in the senate so i spoke with her on it and um she was used to different car seats too so um, I showed her the different setups, showed her the different sizes, took some pictures for that committee, just with a measuring tape in one of the stores, Bye Bye Baby. Some of these seats stick out 34 inches from the back of the car seat. And I just don't understand how you fit them in any vehicle. Mm. So fortunately, the Senate fixed our mistake and instead of having this law now and doing this quickly in a condensed session, there's going to be a committee so right. they've established a study committee to look at it with a member of the senate four members of the house and to just really look at what's happening in new hampshire i right. mean new hampshire we're the state that has higher seatbelt usage than massachusetts and and it's not required <laughs> exactly so right. so we know how to we know how to take care of ourselves and our children so right. yeah and like it's it i mean and the other thing is like you put a big two-year-old the real facing seat in the back seat you can't see them Mm -hmm. So if the kid's getting sick or something, you can't see that. And they're too big. Some of you get too big. So it used to be weight and height, which let's leave it at that. You know, if let the, have infants, small infants, depending on that weight and height in the rear-facing seats, not big two-year-olds. And that's <laughs> one of the things, too. When you look at the car seats, when it's forward-facing, a kid needs to be a certain size. Otherwise, you're not allowed to put them forward-facing. Mm. So just going with how the seats are designed keeps the kids safe. Right. Because yeah. we already have in the law that they need to be restrained if they're seven or younger, and that's based on height and weight, too. Yeah. So one thing good, the Senate did something good. Mm -hmm. We usually complain they always do something bad, but... This time they did something good. And that was the same with my, um, imagine that Regina Birdsell Senator, she's also on the election law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I put in the bill that she had to move the primary to um, August from September, but the House voted on the bill to move it to June, which I think is totally ridiculous. Because, and so the Senate changed that bill to be August. The, the House bill is now August. It passed, but we're waiting to see what the governor's going to do. And mainly, that's mainly for the military. Mm -hmm. Give enough time for the military, like if they're overseas and whatnot, to vote. Right now, the Holly isn't. So just give them another month. And and you know, and there are thir 12, 13 other states that have it in August. So that's, but sometimes the Senate does good things. And, but Yeah, Senator Birdsell happened, helped on my election bill too. Um, they actually have it so that you can check the records against change of address, not just once a year, but as many right. times as the Secretary of State wants to do it. So it's That's great right. when we're able to work together with both yeah. chambers. Yeah, and I've known Regina when she was in the State House. She was a rep and whatnot. So I would, 
You know, and I remember one trip we bumped into her at the airport. <laughs> she was going to the same place and it was interesting she came back the same time <laughs> she's fantastic I'm really yeah. glad that she's uh, my senator in close yeah. by okay now let's take a look at SB 147 so this was one of the omnibus bills that the senate sent over to us so they don't always do things that make things better uh, in this bill they took four different bills and stuck them together they had applications for federal student aid that's the FAFSA form what they sent over to us was that every student would be required to fill out a FAFSA or fill out a waiver. And you know, there's good reasons not to fill out a waiver. There's a lot of kids who know that they're not going to qualify. And having to fill out a waiver says, sorry, my parents have been too successful and I need to tell you that I'm not going to qualify for aid. Right now we do identify students that are lower income, but we don't have anything that identifies those students on the other end. And you know, that's just an intrusion into family privacy. Then there's other students who have a family business. They may, they may not be making a lot of money, but they may have a great family business that is something that they want to be part of and grow. I mean, they might have a good, solid, middle-class income where you know, you'd qualify on the FAFSA. But if you're not even going to go to school because you're a lot better off just learning from your parents and continuing the family business, why is that the school's business that you're going to file a waiver? So um, we ended up having this one in a committee conference, and they just weren't going to agree to completely getting rid of, uh, of needing to file that. So what we have is that um, this, the principal is, res is responsible for saying that they did, in fact, offer counseling and offer information to these students, but they chose not to fill out the FAFSA. And we also have some, some data recording in there, too. Yeah, which is what your guidance council should be doing anyway. And there is an organization, I keep, keep forgetting the name, that goes around to the school districts during say, the students' junior year and invite the families and the students in in the evening and explain to them the FAFSA and the filling out the forms and all this stuff. So there's plenty of people way of doing it. Uh, the, the proponents of the bill said, well, it really works in Louisiana. Now, Louisiana is, is 50th in education in the country. So... <laughs> mm -hmm. we, don't we need to be careful when we're adopting other states' methods. Right. And there's actually a new version coming out, too. So going from, I think it's an eight-page form, I heard. My kids are elementary age, so mm -hmm. I, I last I filled one out was for myself. I think it's going to be a two-page form, and that's going to have a lot more people going ahead and filling it out if, they're, if, if uh, it's going to be useful to them. So I, I don't think we even needed anything here because the change in form is fixing mm -hmm. things for us. But... You know, there's the question too, why do we have this bill and, and deal with that when it's something that we didn't think was going to benefit students? Right. But we have a lot of other really important things in here too. There's um, yeah. a part about abuse and neglect um, in the part two. But most importantly, I don't know if you've ever seen a school go out on these contract carriers, taking the Concord Trailways around, yeah. having the marching band stick their tubas underneath. Um, have a football team or a hockey team put their gear underneath so it's not going to be bouncing around um, either just in regular driving or in a crash. But until we passed this law, passed this bill, it was illegal for schools to do that because yeah, there was no method for it. Which nobody knew it. There's the same buses the seventh grade mm -hmm. takes down to Washington, D.C. and they used to. And, or I remember I was on a, 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 a field trip to Europe and we took the, a coach bus down to the airport with all the luggage and everything. Yeah, I mean, that was illegal, and nobody knew it. And we, the DMV said, yeah, we just don't have anybody enforcing it. But it was still illegal for your school to do that. So part three of this bill fixes that. Actually, so. legendary marching band, when they're going to the Rose Parade, still can't take it because Boston Logan is less than 150 miles round trip. Oh, okay. But that's for another year. The big fight was about background checks. There's right. chaperones and teachers on them, and right. people and wanted have to have background checks. checks, yet we don't have background checks for people presenting in libraries. So yeah. <laughs> consistency yeah. is important. Yeah, they were saying, well, the, the, the coach driver doesn't have a background check. But early trips, there are... <laughs> but still, laws say, you know, pedophiles can't be around children, so the school bus company, the, not the bus, the coach company won't hire them anyway. There are teachers and parents. Even when I was on that school trip, I had to do a background check for me. I was on the school board, that fingerprint and everything, because I was going to be 
let kids overnight type thing. Yeah, the school but, policies and the school laws make sure that there's enough adults there that are right. looking out for the kids' safety right. and that those people have been checked out. Yeah. And so and oh, and then this one also has an amazing Easter egg for our schools. Um, so special education costs can get really, really high. Um, some students that go into residential facilities, it's $300,000 a year because they have really profound needs. So this, um, we added in a special education risk management association. So if five or more districts want to join together and share that risk either amongst themselves or through an insurance product, they can. So that, that was really fantastic. And I was really, really happy that we passed that because I think it's gonna help out a lot of small districts. Yeah, it was, a, it was not, I mean, it was, we tried this last session and didn't go and, and it worked this session. And uh, hopefully, you know, it'll work with basically some small school districts can combine with each other and come up with a risk pool or even get risk pool insurance for that. Uh, one of the things was it was some of the contention on the bill was for small, just made a blanket thing for small schools. But some small school districts are very rich, like they have a ski resort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, and but there's a there's money also extra money set aside for those mm -hmm. districts. But it's up to and what we heard is there was two hundred fifty thousand. They added another two hundred fifty thousand. But the Department of Education says over the last five years they only spent fifty thousand. Of that, so it's that part of it isn't. But anyway, risk pools are for small school districts. I don't think I mean that haven't set aside any kind of. Uh, I believe we have a um, a fund for. There, there is for a that. fund for for some of those emergency needs, uh, but doing this uh, special education fund lets them figure out whatever rules are going to be advantageous and if, if it helps the district they can vote to do that yeah. and if it doesn't then they don't yeah and and 148 I was on the committee of conference on this one mm. anyway one of the problems we have with the Senate this year and we've been told and they've been told don't do it again because uh, next year if they do it again there's going to be a lot of kill bills because a lot of us or even um, leadership is very upset about this the, one of the problems is Senate committees do not always align with House committees. The different names and they don't, so they put bills together on their committee which doesn't match. And, and, and we were lucky in education, we only had bills with, with five different bills stuck in. Judiciary, for example, they had bills with 12, 13. And, and some of them weren't in there and you can't, you know, and you try to change them and what they try to do too is the Senate, I know they've done this for years, is they, they took one of my bills, which was on consent in the Senate calendar, they pulled it off consent, they had something they wanted in it. Because they knew that we really wanted it, because, you know, but, and they've always, they've always done that. We sometimes, done, not as often as the Senate does it. They, we have some rules that they don't have. And, and our joke is the Senate, they don't have any rules. But you know. so, for example, we have deadlines and when to put in bills, and the Senate seems to put in bills anytime they want to. Uh, hopefully, no senators are listening. Uh, um, one forty-eight. Oh boy, it's the it? first part was just cleaning up a bunch of outdated right. information. Yeah, the Department of Education gave hey, need to get rid of these and change these. In other words, they're all outdated. The next one is career technical education. Now, it's trying to fix uh, transportation issues with career tech education. One of the problems is, for example, Manchester. Since Manchester West, for example, they're in the same school district and they send their kids over to their, their CTE center, which is near um, or in um, Memorial, on the other side of the city. It takes longer for them to travel from west to that than it does for us sending our kids to Albert. But the problem is we get money for transportation, not as much as we should, uh, and which we're looking at to, a transportation cost in that. 
but Manchester wouldn't get any because they're in the same district. So this fixes hopefully Manchester, Nashua, and Exeter. That we're, yeah, it, big district in the same, yeah, but th they have to travel. So, and so that's the transportation part of it. And, and we're, we, I'm also on the committee, Career Technical Education Committee, which we've been meeting on, looking at the, all the issues with career tech. Initially started with the transportation pit piece. We made a bill for a committee, but then the Senate sent one over, we passed it, but then, um, so we committed, so we're looking at all aspects of the career tech ed, trying to align things, make things work, uh, get, uh, students getting credit and all that. Um, Oh, the emergency plans for sports-related injuries. That was something I think every we have, I think, in our school is just to have plans for any related injuries in sports. We tried to change it to everything, any kind of injury for, for any extracurricular, but the Senate was adamant about that it had to be just for sports. And when it came over from the Senate, it had a lot of information about coming back to play after having COVID. And then there was a lot of other things where it violated student privacy. Yeah. So while it still ended up staying just with sports and didn't cover marching bands or any of that, right. um, it, it we did improve it so that the, there's not really personal medical information in the hands of too many people. And then uh, there was the yoga schools too. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> well, post-secondary career schools, that, yeah, that was the thing of just limit. We, if your school, whatever you're teaching, is that the current law is if you have to have a bond, in other words, if students are paying, you have to be bonded. So, But we set that to if the school is, only if the school's making more than $100,000. So the small, in the small businesses that, like yoga was brought up. If somebody teaching yoga to 20 people, you know, they don't have to post the bond, which is which will put them out of business. So th that was something like that. Also, um, environmental and outdoor education, that um, some places are already doing this. One good example is, and I saw it on Chronicle one night, and this this allows credit for that activity where they a bunch of high school kids go spend the whole good part of the winter outdoors camping and whatnot and learning how to live in the environment. So those kind of things, hopefully we can, you know, work on getting that covered. Okay. Okay, HB 69, that's a good one. Uh, so I'll pull it up and I know you were involved with this one, Erica. It was definitely a good one. And listening to the testimony on the House floor was just quite amazing. Yeah. Um, there, there was a great, great testimony on both sides, and both, both of them made me want to support the, way, the bill the way that it came out of the Committee of Conference. It came over to us first just having the national motto to um, prevent any, any district or any town from preventing the display of the national motto. Um, it was added to also include our state motto. So we heard testimony about how live free or die could be harmful to students' mental health. But more importantly, we had uh, some great testimony as well about how important it is to understand our country and our state. Yeah. And yeah, it's, yeah, the Senate added putting in the, um, the, the state motto, live free or die. The thing is, I, mean, I remember 9-11 when it happened our three schools on their board in front of the school had the, in God we trust, put on it. This doesn't say the schools have to do it. It says if they do do it, you're suing the state, you're not suing the school, because the law says you can do it. So it, it protects the school district if they want to, you know, and that was the whole thing. And then the whole argument, well, what God? You know, well, last time I checked things history-wise, Muslims, Jews, and Christians all believe in the same God, and those are your three major religions. <laughs> you know, so uh, they have different views on it, but 
Well, and then translation. You can substitute gods for God if right. that makes you more comfortable. Allah then. means God. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, and God is a generic term. It's not in capital letters, uh, I don't believe, on the motto. So, but, and it's on our license plate, for example, live free or die. Okay, so that's, that's a good, it just allows schools to do it if they want to, and nobody's gonna, and if anybody yells, jumps up and down, and says you can't do that because it's, it's against me. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, next we have SB 31. So this one, um, it, it updated the form on the absentee checklist, or the absentee forms and on the absentee out, uh, ballot um, envelopes. There were some questions in a lot of towns about how people filled them out. Just in the past, there's been a lot fewer people doing absentee, so it was easier to explain what was going on. But with the huge volume of absentee, we had people that were sending the ballot not enclosed in the outside envelope. Um, they were sending them without it signed. There were all sorts of exceptions that, that were made this year in order to deal with the chaos of 2020. So now it has more of that information on there. It takes away the COVID, the specific COVID exemption that had been put in. And it also makes it clear because it was passed to allow people who are incarcerated, incarcerated for a misdemeanor or, um, or a pending trial, it allows them to mark on the absentee ballot that that's why they're voting absentee because that is allowed. It was actually kind of neat the way that they wrote it. They had the two options, whether or not that bill passed. So as a bit of a nerd, I thought that was actually a great way to deal with that uncertainty. I really yeah. liked that. Yeah. Um, and it just, just clarifies the language, makes it easier. And if we decide to move to having unfolded ballots going absentee, then it'd be really easy in there just to change a word. It says that it needs to fit the ballot. If we need to go to unfolded, it could say fit the unfolded ballot, if yeah. that's deemed necessary. Yeah. Yeah, that was the big issue with Wyndham. Remember, they had this big problem, and everybody's blaming the machines. It actually comes down to people weren't following the rules in Wyndham, and uh, you know, and they were using a folding the absentee ballots because there was a whole lot of them this time, not correctly, and uh, so, and that was the big issue. Also, there seemed to be some on. The ballots not being counted, or were they counted, or weren't they? Yeah. So in one case, it was like 200 different. Two. Uh, normally, I like the machines, and I remember when I was a selectman, I was the one that got the machines in Litchfield after looking in Bedford and Hudson, because the previous election, we were up to four o'clock in the morning counting ballots, ballots, and to me, the machines can be more accurate if they're done right. The thing is, you're supposed to. Check the machines beforehand. You get, you take the ballots and and you feed them through, knowing what the result should be. Now the ballots can go into the machines one of four ways. They can go in this way, they can go in this way, they can go in this way, and go it in this way. So I mean, and every, every count should come out the same. Uh, our secretary of state made the comment. And he said. I don't care how many times you count the ballots, either by machine or by person, you're gonna get, if you count them 10 different times, you're gonna get 10 different results. I mean, and I think the machines in most cases are more accurate than people counting, because at three o'clock in the morning, even if you have four or five people counting and whatnot, it's, it could be, you know, wait a minute, is that marked there or is that not, you know, so it's. That's one of the things too, that figuring out what that deviation is, that might be helpful too. If we can know what the normal difference is, then that would yeah. be a great way to find potential problems in the future too. Yeah, the thing is in most cases, Wyndham was the only really had a, a bad example, but on other recounts that were done, there was only a few votes different. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and no result was changed. No, even with the Wyndham fiasco, no result. <laughs> that was lucky it. that it wasn't a change because that, that, that could have gone the other way Yeah. if it had been but just no, a few more folded that yeah. way. But no, no, mm -hmm. yeah, the and, top, mm -hmm. yeah, so. And this bill also has another nice feature to it too. It isn't just the absentee ballots. It's also that um, if you enter a place that you last registered to vote, if it's within the state, it goes right into the state database. Yeah. And there's also a method for the Secretary of State to reach out to other other um, 
other states in order to make sure that somebody is not voting in both places right. and that uh, there is a notification too where um, it will say that you're registered to vote in Michigan and you can say actually I'm not <laughs> because you get a letter saying that and then you can make sure that nobody's taking your identity to vote in another state so there's some really nice features that have come out of this year you know, yeah. I'm sure there's still more work to do, but I know that we've made some good progress. Yeah, it's because one of the problems is it's removing people from the thing. And I think we covered that last week with the bill. Uh, now, just a couple of quickies. SB 27, relative to the sale of Lucky 7 tickets and uh, charitable gaming is licensed now for 12 months from the issue of from December 31st. Um, it corrects uh, incorrect references to the lottery commission and changes the definition of a deal in reference to Lucky Seven. So those I have no idea what any of this is because I don't gamble. But <laughs> <laughs> I play poker, but I don't gamble. Right. Well, <laughs> poker is not gambling. Poker is a skill. It is. That's why if you go to a casino. The house is not playing poker. The house is taking this dealing and taking a percentage of the pot. So they know better. <laughs> poker is a, is a skill. It's not gambling. I know. <laughs> That's why I do it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. If you if you're good with numbers, then yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just too lazy. But anyway, <laughs> um, another SB 104. I'm not going to go into it, but it was one of those eleven eleven things that the Senate sent over in one bill. And you know, and it covers everything from from a certain state employee positions, reverse aug auctions, um, hearing hearings at the board of nursing, temporary licensure of certain licensed nursing assistants, schools for barbering, cosmetology, and aesthetics, telemedicine providing by out of state psychologists, and all that in one, and it should have been in like 11 separate bills. The thing is, for example, that one bill, we had 147 with the FAFSA stuff in it. I mean, if that came over like it should have rather than four, one bill, we would have easily just ITL'd the FAFSA thing. Uh, because that, that's, oh, yeah. You know. We would have waited to see if the two-page form fixed the problem. Yeah, because but I the think thing with that, it's, it's like, you know, to me, it would be no different than, I made this comment on the committee, that, okay, let's require all schools to have every student fill out a free and reduced lunch application. It's no different. I mean, it's, it's just way beyond what schools should be doing. You know? So with that, I think we probably went a little bit over, but we're on, on good. So we hopefully we can come back and cover more. I know I'm, I'm scheduling uh, in a few weeks. Next week we will... We'll have a meeting uh, with Rich LaSalle to go over some stuff. And then I will have, uh, hopefully, maybe early August, uh, Kate Baker on to go over the Education Freedom Accounts. Oh, fantastic. It'll be great to get more info there. You're right, so we can tell you how to go about doing that. So, and hopefully we'll have Erica back on when we have some more bills or whatnot to cover. <laughs> and maybe when the governor went, well, here's what happened, see. We passed all these bills. Okay, the governor signed some off. What happens is the speaker and the Senate, they look at the bills and see if there's anything that needs to be fixing or whatnot, or sometimes politically, they release the bills to the, to the clerk. Well, the House releases the House bills to the Senate. The Senate can do stuff with it, look at them to make sure everything is good. Then they give it to the clerk. The clerk looks for spelling errors and maybe some minor grammatical changes that doesn't change the bill and makes changes with the agreement of house reps and that kind of, but nothing major. And then it goes to the Secretary of State. Then the Secretary of State makes sure everything's legal and that he, you know, and then it goes to the governor. The problem is if you look at the status, for example, the docket, let's just for S, of SB 27, you see, it report was adopted on 6 June 24th. It hasn't been enrolled yet. <laughs> enrolled said it's ready to go to the governor. And if you look at what the governor has signed, it hasn't really signed that many bills. He hasn't gotten any. 
and most of the bills he signed, like, who cares? You know, type bills, you know, minor, minor things. Other than, which is interesting, the budget, HB1 and HB2, that was signed the day after we passed it. So, I mean, you know, they can go immediately, but, you know, because the budget had to be done by the end of the year. Normally, you meet every, almost every week, so there's not this backlog right. either. So yeah. there's just so many bills sitting yeah, there. Yeah, that's why I was hoping to, when I was doing this legislative update, a weekly thing, so we can go on what bills we passed this week. The problem is I'm going to be meeting once a, tw once a month and then three days in a row and doing a couple hundred bills at once. And it's, and the decorum isn't right, um, you know. I mean, and also with the, you can get more speakers when we're, you know, doing it weekly to speak, because I, I, I was prepared to speak on a couple of bills, but they were tabled. <laughs> Damn it. But anyway, <laughs> but it, it's bad. I mean, you don't even know where the speakers are. You know, you see it when we do the video because the camera's on them, there's a bunch of different cameras. But you can see the mess it was at the, I don't really want to do that again. Hopefully we'll be home next year, mm -hmm. next January when we have our first, uh, session to let this probably might be a veto session coming in in september if the governor vetoes any bills he's only done one which we we had to vote it on and it didn't yeah we didn't override the veto but anyway nothing minor so with that thank, thank you, you so much for having me on thank you and we'll, we'll do it again for sure um because you do your homework but <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so, good evening or good day or good night or whatever.